Uh, all right, so let's get started since we're running a bit late. Uh, for this final panel, we are going to be discussing uh, legacy liabilities for coal mining companies, uh, which include liabilities related to reclamation and cleanup costs for retired or abandoned mines, uh, as well as liabilities related to the provision of employee and retiree benefits. And uh, there's, of course, some overlap with the previous panel because this issue of bankruptcy uh, is very much front and center when we're thinking about how and whether these companies can actually be held liable for the costs of environmental cleanup and health and disability benefits and pensions. So we're going to be starting with uh, a presentation from Mark Squilacci, a professor at Colorado Law School, who's going to be talking about reclamation liabilities under the Surface Mining Control and Reclamation Act. Uh, and then we're going to be hearing from David Hillman, a partner at Schulte, Roth, and Zabel, who's going to be talking about labor-related liabilities, particularly uh, legacy health care costs for retirees. Uh, and then finally, Andy Stevenson, a managing director at Just Capital, will be talking about taxpayer exposures to these costs when coal companies go bankrupt and are unable to pay them. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started okay, with Mark. Thank you, thank you, Jessica. And I, I just want to take a moment to thank the organizers of this uh, uh, workshop here today. It's been really terrific. I've learned a lot. I clearly have a lot to learn as well. And uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to participate uh, today. My task today is to try to tell you a little bit about this law that's been bandied about a bit today, the Surface Mining Control and Reclamation Act. And I'm, I'm focusing entirely on, or as much as I can, on the reclamation issues associated with the act. Uh, the act's quite complex, so I'm just going to be scratching the surface. Uh, let me just first start by acknowledging something that many of you probably know, which is the Surface Mining Act essentially adopts a cooperative federalism structure which of course means that there's a federal, minimum federal standards and independent regulatory enforcement power in the Federal Office of Surface Mining. Um, states generally have control over most aspects of mining, but the feds play an important oversight role. Virtually every major coal producing state has primary authority to regulate mining, the only exception being the state of Tennessee. Um, the, the, the statute and, and the regulations under the statute have fairly specific and uh, strict requirements for reclamation uh, under the law. And, and just to sort of give you a general feel for it, you basically have to restore the pre-mining capacity of the land after mining is done. It is not easy to do it. You have to do things like eliminating the high walls on steep slope areas. You have to restore the uh, agricultural productivity of the land and you have to uh, restore pre-mining hydrologic conditions. These are not easy things to do, and that's why this reclamation issue is so important, because it is, it is neither easy nor cheap to actually do the reclamation work. We've been talking a little bit about bonding, particularly on the last panel. Uh, I think Peter on the last panel mentioned that the Surface Mining Act specifically requires that a reclamation bond be posted and that it be adequate to allow the regulatory agency to essentially do the work if the company walks away. And it's important to note here that liability under the statute extends generally for anywhere from five to ten years after all of the self-sustaining vegetation has been completed on the mine site. Um, we've also been talking a little bit in the last panel about self-bonding. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that uh, now. I want to just note, however, that in order to self-bond under the current rules, you still have to meet very detailed financial criteria. Um, Bankruptcies obviously are wreaking havoc on this self-bonding kind of program. We've talked a lot today about some of the big companies that have, um, have been uh, going uh, through the bankruptcy process, and many of them self-bond, Alpha Resources, Arch and Peabody. Just from Wyoming, the liabilities are well beyond the promises that have been made in the bankruptcy proceedings in terms of what... Uh, what the companies are promising. I'll get, come back to this in a minute, but it's really important that we think about how um, the states have been dealing with the problems with the self-bonds that, that are currently out there. I've got a question mark on this slide. I say asset ma manipulation to justify self-bonding, and the question is because this seems to be done, being done in a very transparent way vis-a-vis -vis the state and federal agencies. And I, I just found this quote from OSM somewhat shocking. Note this was uh, issued in a fact statement, a fact sheet about self-bonding 
early last year. While it may be true that Peabody and Arch do not meet requirements for self-bonding, they are not the guarantors of their minds. Uh, there are wholly owned subsidiary companies that do meet the requirements for self-bonds. This practice is in full compliance with state and federal law. I found this shocking. Are they serious that when they look at the parent company of these wholly owned subsidiaries and they realize they don't meet criteria, it, are they really going to allow the parent company to park just enough assets to qualify for a bond? Apparently, it's not only okay, but according to OSM back in February of last year, they're in full compliance uh, with state and federal laws. Uh, I suppose maybe it seems a little I ironic, but it's also unfortunate that less than one year later, Arch and its subsidiary filed for uh, Chapter 11 bankruptcy, which of course we've been talking about today. So what do you have to do um, to reclaim the land? Or, or how does it go under the performance requirements of the law? Well, interesting kind of problem here that relates to self-bonding, I think. Because the statute says that you have to contemporaneously reclaim the land, contemporaneous with the mining. And during the Carter administration, which was the administration in power when the law was passed, there were what we called time and distance requirements put in the law. You couldn't get it too far away or too far in time from the area that you would disturb before you had to, had to be reclaiming it. But what's happened, uh, what's happened is that during the Reagan administration, those were all repealed. We went back to the statutory language. And this has become a really big problem, especially in the West, regarding companies that self-bond. Because if you self-bond, you have absolutely no incentive to speed up reclamation. And because of the very strict standards that I talked about earlier, you probably don't want to go through the audit that you're going to be put through if you try to get your bond release. And so there has been virtually no land in Wyoming which has had its bond released from the time that the Surface Mining Act was, was passed. And, and, and the result is that there's a lot more land that needs to be reclaimed that has not been reclaimed. Uh, be, and I think much of it can be attributed to the fact that companies self-bond. They're not putting anything on the line in order to do this. Now, I want to talk for a few minutes about enforcement. I want to give my co-panelists uh, time as well. Um, so what do we know about how the law is enforced? Well, it's, again, somewhat complicated, but basically there is a provision in the law that says that if a company is in violation of the law, the state is supposed to issue, if the state is in charge, what's called a notice of violation or an NOV and demand full compliance within 90 days or less. Um, and if you fail to abate that violation within that 90 days, in theory at least, you're supposed to shut down the mine. That's explicit in the statute. And, of course, if the state fails to enforce when there's evidence of a violation, the federal government is supposed to step in and issue the NOV. There's a process that's involved, but basically that's what's going on. Now, the point here is that if you fail to post an adequate reclamation bond, you are in violation of the Federal Surface Mining Act, and you, you arguably should not uh, have a permit under those circumstances. You should have the mine uh, <coughs> shut down if you do not get a full reclamation bond within the 90-day period. I happen to think that there, there ought to be, and there probably is some sort of compromise process that could be reached here that would allow the company to, to deal with the backlog of reclamation that I talked about a moment ago in the context of coming into compliance. So it's not just that the company should be posting full surety bonds to guarantee the reclamation. They also need to deal with this huge backlog of reclamation that's going on and, and I think that's a part of the um, message that has not been getting through, at least up to this particular time. Um, I just want to note, I mean, I was really interested in the last panel and just the discussion of bankruptcy. Uh, fascinating to hear about uh, the, the obligation, I guess I would say, that the companies have to comply with the law. Bankruptcy doesn't get you out of complying with the law. Very pleased to hear that. That would be a serious problem, right? We, we went through this before we had the Surface Mining Act. It was talked about a little bit today with all these old abandoned mines that are draining acid into our streams. And it's been going on for years and years. And the risk is that we're going to go back to that. It was supposed to be stopped by the Surface Mining Act. Well, if they have to comply, this becomes a really important thing. I would note, by the way, in response to Ed's excellent presentation, that there is I believe it's in the regulations, but at least it's in the, the administrative case law at Interior, that if you're mining without a valid permit, and mining without a full bond is without a valid permit, that is an imminent 
danger to the health and safety of the environment. And so we may meet, we may meet the U U.S. Supreme Court standard on that. It's something, something to watch. I'll have to pull that out uh, as we go. Mark, uh, is, isn't there a distinction, though, between compliance with the law and, and if a state regulator like Wyoming says you have to uh, replace your self bonds with a surety bond uh, versus the ability to comply, right? Yes. So, I mean, so, so if you're, I mean, there's no doubt that you should be allowed to come into compliance by posting a full surety bond. I'm not that sure but, if that's what you're asking. But if you, David. If the, I mean, in the Arch Coal example, I think Wyoming was asking for replacing the, the bond of uh, $486 million. Right. right. And the debtor simply could not, uh, didn't have, well, that wasn't a feasible request. Right, right. So, so my response to that, and, yeah, and you obviously can't do it in 90 days either which is why it seems to me that a violation should be issued. And in order to sort of deal with the problem, you shouldn't just have to come into compliance by posting a full bond within a period of time. I hope it's not 20 years. Uh, but in any event, you ought to be able to get that bond more quickly. You also need to deal with that backlog of, of reclamation because then your liability is going to go down. And there ought to, you ought to be on a schedule to ensure that your reclamation liability is being reduced over time. I just want to make two more quick points because I want to, as I said, I want to give time for the others. There's a, obviously a big problem at the mines that are being abandoned where there's not coal still being pulled out. So if you're still pulling out coal, you've got leverage obviously on the company because in order to allow them to continue to pull out coal, you need to bring them into sort of some sort of compliance schedule uh, to deal with the problem of a lack of a bond. And so there's much more leverage there. There's not much, I suppose, if companies are walking away and abandoning these mines. But there is one important thing that I think Brian referred to in the last panel, which is that under the Federal Surface Mining Act, if you're in violation of the law at any permitted site, you cannot get a permit and none of your associates or affiliates or anybody that's related to you in any way is allowed to get a permit for, an, for another mine at another site. And that becomes a really powerful tool perhaps even at these sites that have been um, abandoned by companies. There's an online system called the AVS or Applicant Violator System where you, so state agencies are supposed to go check to make sure before they issue any permits or modifications or anything else to make sure that nobody else with that company's um, pedigree and, and, the, um, and associates are in the system. I just want to finish with one point. Again, uh, lots of things going on. Peter talked about some of the initiatives that are going on, inc including the rulemaking that's there. But the one thing I think that wasn't mentioned is that there is enforcement going on right now, uh, and it's going to be interesting to watch how this plays out. The Potter River Basin Resource Council and Wild Earth Guardians, I think, deserve most of the credit here for sort of pushing this issue. Ish uh, they've been filing citizen complaints, which is a really cool process under the Federal Surface Mining Act that allows a citizen to sort of point out a violation and the government has to respond. And we're in the process now, we've been in the process for uh, almost a year, I think, trying to get the, the federal government to uh, respond in some substantive way and hopefully, I think, issue some citations because these companies are mining without a valid permit because they don't have an adequate bond. And until we get that violation issued, we can't deal with this AVS system problem that I mentioned a bit ago. Thanks very much. Uh, while, while we get some technical assistance out, David Hillman, I'm a partner at Schulte Roth and my practice is exclusively on the bankruptcy side. And I'm industry agnostic. I go wherever there's distress, and I spend my time learning about the distressed industries. And since coal has been distressed, I've spent a fair amount of time assisting our clients dealing with the issues that they face in coal. Uh, today I'm going to focus on some of the labor liabilities, but I can't resist just uh, making a comment on just the, the term of art that I've heard on our panel and the panel before self-bonds. It makes it sound as though there is a bond, that there is a, uh, a surety bond. Yeah. When you hear self-bond, you should just think of a promise. Um, now, it's a binding promise, and it's a real promise, and it's a genuine promise, but it's a promise, and it's not secured by any collateral. And so, uh, as a fundamental rule of bankruptcy, there's a priority totem pole that Congress set out, and it's memorialized in the bankruptcy code. And first and foremost, and this is a, you know, uh, uh, a basic uh, rule of law, secured creditors have first recourse to their collateral, 
Then come administrative expense creditors, those, those people who are providing goods and services in the case. Then there are a small category of priority claims, some tax, some wages. Then you get to the largest pool, the general unsecured claims filed by equity. So when we talk about self-bond, we talk, we're talking about a promise to the uh, regulators that's in the general unsecured claim uh, behind those with collateral. So let's focus on um, labor liabilities. So uh, what, what's happening here in terms of how the bankruptcy code is being deployed to deal with uh, a company's balance sheet with labor liabilities is we're really talking about um, legacy liabilities. And by legacy liabilities, we're talking about those liabilities really for retirees um, for the most part. And, and it reaches a point where the labor-related liabilities basically are so substantial that current cash flows can't satisfy current expenses and all of the liabilities. So I just put a snapshot here of Patriot. Patriot Coal had retiree benefit obligations at the time it filed of 1.6 billion for 21,000 individuals. But the key here is it only had 4,200 individuals on the payroll. So think about how many legacy liabilities they're carrying. Um, now, that was a function of some pre-bankruptcy um, uh, uh, transactions in which it took on some of these liabilities, but, but that exists uh, for, for other companies as well. So today I'll focus uh, primarily on the sources of labor liability, and I, this is not an exhaustive list, but it's a good enough snapshot. So first you have the multi-employer CBA, and in the coal industry there's a multi-employer, an industry-wide uh, collective bargaining agreement. Um, that provides for health and welfare benefits to, uh, to employees. There's a single employer collective bargaining agreement. Um, and then there's what people refer to as the Coal Act, uh, the Coal Industry Retiree Health and Benefit Act. Um, and lastly, there's the Black Lung Act. Um, and the slides are available considering that time is tight rather than read you what's on the slides. What I thought would be better is to walk through to talk about the liabilities and more specifically, I think this goes to a point that Brian Resnick made on an earlier panel. Where do these liabilities fit? Um, what is their priority in a bankruptcy case? What is their priority relative to other creditors or other stakeholders? So the, the first question, and, and, and when, you're a, when you're a debtor, when you're a coal company, one of the things that you're looking to do is to use the bankruptcy case to discharge, to modify, to eliminate some of these liabilities. So the, the question that we have to ask for each one of these liabilities is, is it modifiable? Can we eliminate these liabilities in bankruptcy? So um, I think the prior panel pretty much covered this issue, so I won't go into any level of detail, but the question is, can you modify uh, a debtor's liability under its collective bargaining agreements and its uh, uh, promises to make, uh, to provide health care benefits to its retirees? And the answer is yes. Uh, there are certain procedural requirements, but it gets done. Um, uh, you, you saw the slides before on, on Patriot Coal. It gets done, and it is modifiable and dischargeable. So let's talk about the Coal Act. The Coal Act generally uh, provides statute that's, that mandates that coal companies provide health care benefits to their own retirees and to their dependents under the coal operator's uh, health care benefit plan that it offers to its own employees. So basically, the Coal Act says that the company must pick up its own retirees under the existing plan. So that's the first obligation, an obligation to provide benefits. The second obligation is an obligation to pay premiums uh, to fund certain trust funds that were established by the COAL Act. And, and basically, these trust funds are designed to provide um, health care benefits for um, employees whose operators are no longer in business. Sometimes they're referred to as uh, orphaned employees. So here, we, we ask the same question. Are these liabilities, are these obligations to provide health care benefits and to pay 
premiums? Are they modifiable or can you terminate them? And so the answer again is yes with respect to um, uh, <coughs> the, the obligation to provide the benefits. And there's at least a couple of cases that are cited here, Horizon Natural Resources and Walter Energy, which stand for the proposition that a debtor can use Section 1114 to modify Coal Act obligations. What's interesting is that um, much of the many of the cases that deal with the application of 1113 and 1114 deal with modifying contracts or liabilities under contracts. Here, what, that there's a tension in that the bankruptcy code 1114 is being used to modify a liability arising under a statute. So, you know, there, there's a couple of, the, Walter is a recent case, 2015, but it's, it's out of Alabama. We don't have any circuit court level decisions. So one question that remains, even though there is authority, will other courts follow suit and allow a debtor to use the bankruptcy code to modify the statutory obligations? The next question is, what about the premiums? Um, and courts have generally said we're going to treat the premiums differently, that is the Coal Act premiums, and, and the courts that have addressed this squarely, and you can see they're relatively dated, 95, 96, 97, have said we're going to treat those premiums as taxes. And what that means is the taxes are going to be paid as an administrative uh, priority expense in the bankruptcy case, and they're going to get paid. All right, let's flip to the uh, Black Lung Act. So. Um, for the Black Lung Act, each coal mine operator has to pay some health and disability benefits to uh, certain current and former employees who suffer pneumonicosis or black lung disease. And basically, the coal operators are paying a tax on the coal that they're, uh, that they're removing from the ground. <coughs> and there's a process set up with the Department of Labor for a miner that files uh, a claim. Um, basically, the Department of Labor assigns responsibility to a particular operator. <coughs> and so if the operator can't, um, uh, doesn't pay the miner's claim, then the trust fund basically <coughs> pays the miner um, and gets a federal lien for what it pays on account of the uh, black lung payment. And so the trust fund, if it pays the claim, has a secured claim. Um, against the operator, and that lien has the same priority as a federal tax lien. Uh, so, but here's, here's where the, the real issue is. Um, the Black Lung Act imposes some personal liability for officers and directors that don't comply with the obligations of the Black Lung Act, and, and it requires them in certain instances to get a surety bond or to otherwise post some collateral. So. <laughs> When you're dealing with a liability where the directors and officers face personal liability, do you think it gets discharged? Do you think it gets modified? The answer is no. It, it, gets, it gets paid in full because these uh, individuals who are making the decisions face personal liability. Um, those are the highlights that I've tried to uh, speed through to sort of keep us on track, on schedule, especially knowing we're the last panel. Thank you. All right. So. In a dramatic departure, I'm actually going to use only numbers for the rest of the, uh, the next 10 minutes. <laughs> I'm not a words guy. I'm a, a finance guy. I've spent 25 years as an investment banker, hedge fund manager. It's, I'm more interested in the numbers, and I'm more interested in the numbers in pr this particular case because it affects me. So, you know, if you're going to make a, a golden spatula company and it goes bankrupt, the guy that made the investment in the spatula company and you lose money, in this case, the people that are on the hook are the taxpayers. So I just wanted to give that as a little preface to why this is a little different and uh, why these numbers are big and meaningful and there should be a, more of a con conversation about a solution and less of a conversation, well, whatever. Anyway, moving, moving through it, um, just to give you some short-term numbers, where are we? So we've, uh, the big three coal companies alone have about $3.7 billion in legal liabilities uh, that are probably just going to disappear into the, into the earth. So uh, Alpha Natural, Peabody, and Arch Coal a lot of these asset, uh, these are mostly are asset uh, obligations uh, for reclamation, but there's also pension and uh, post-medical uh, retirement benefits that also must be considered. It was mentioned earlier that Patriot Coal left the taxpayer with about a billion dollars worth of a bill. These guys are, uh, are working on just about that number. Um, in terms of what this means, 
there's this idea that these uh, obligations, these self-obligations are going to be um, you know, made whole at some stage of the game. If you look at what's really happened so far, they basically have been selling around 15 cents on the dollar. So you're looking at about $2.2 .2 billion worth of claims and about, 500, about $400 million of settlements that have been agreed to. I mean, you can argue that these things, that these, some of these coal, comp these coal mines will actually be uh, productive at some point, but a lot of these coal assets are just dead in the water. They're not going anywhere. Um, just to give you an example of uh, what happens in the bankruptcy proceedings, there's just a big question mark really on this slide. If you uh, actually sum up the number of mines that went into the Alpha Natural Bankruptcy, is about 140 mines. What's coming out the other end is about 40 mines. And you could argue that uh, the new Alpha has got a few of these on the, you know, that they are accountable for. Contura certainly does not. But you're looking at basically about 100 mines. Interestingly enough, that all the Massey Energy mines uh, are not part of the reclamation, are not part of the new Alpha. So they bought something for $8.2 billion in 2011. It is now worth so little that they are leaving it to the taxpayer to clean up. So that's 85 mines out of the 100, and 100 odd mines. Let's look at now the long-term obligations. This is uh, some work that was interesting work done by McKinsey uh, last uh, December. And basically the argument is, look, these, this industry has a lot of obligations and a lot of these are running obligations, as in you need to keep making money to pay these off. And if you only have half as many tons coming out of the ground as you did five years ago, guess what? There's going to be a big loss. And that loss is probably going to be absorbed by the taxpayer. And this is just the breakdown of all those, uh, the different liabilities and where they're like, the debt is sort of, you know, somebody else's problem. All the, all the ones that I'm referring to, which are the pensioners, the workers' comp, the retirement, the medical. The medical obviously affects the states. The states are the ones that are on the hook for people walking in the door when they don't have insurance. It obviously hurts taxpayers because the, the, you know, the, the costs at the hospital go up. So let's just look at just the reclamation alone. So what are the long-term uh, costs of reclamation? Well, if you look at, if you actually go to the AML program website and actually look at the numbers, they're pretty startling. First of all, they have about $2.3 billion worth of assets that is non-covered, like covered. like they're not spoken for. The current obligations are around $9.3 billion. So if you look at, it's really Pennsylvania that takes up the bulk of that. It's about $5 billion. It's sort of waiting to get paid is the right way to describe it in my book. Uh, if you take off the, if you include the, the recent bankruptcy claims, you're looking at more like $11 billion. It's sitting out there that needs to be paid for. And then there's this sort of future obligations, which is really a lot of mines, especially in the central Appalachian area, that just aren't coming back. And so they're not coming back. There's no way that these things are going to have any future value. Uh, from a reclamation standpoint, so you have to look at those as being also pretty serious liabilities. So next, the question now is, what do we do with this situation? We basically have a very, very large liability that the taxpayer is currently on the hook for. And the only way out of it, I mean, the bankruptcy court has been described, is doing its job. Bankruptcy is bankruptcy. You come in with no money, very little of it sticks, you know, you pay what you can pay and that's the end of it. The, the creditor in this case is really the, the, the taxpayer. So we have ourselves roughly a $30 billion ta uh, proposition that's coming on with the, tax, with the coal industry. The question really is, is this a gift to the, ta to the coal industry, as in are we paying this reclamation, or is it a loan to the, tax, to the coal industry? That's really the question that we need to answer. Um, just to give you a sense of the size of that, if you look at what happened with the U.S. bailout, it was about uh, 9.4 billion was the net taxpayer cost of this. We're talking about something 3x of what's going on here. I mean, you can argue that the, the bailout was, I'm, I'm from Detroit, I'm very happy there was a bailout, don't get me wrong, lots of jobs uh, were saved in that bankruptcy. I think it was a very valuable operation. For the American public, it was a very high value proposition. I'm just saying that we are of a huge loss here with the coal industry and we have to make a similar decision. If we want to call it a gift, then we, we should call it a gift and it is effectively a taxpayer bailout. If we want to call it a loan, we need to think about a way to pay that back. So how do we get that done, right? In the short term, we could be, we could be thinking about something I would refer to as a bailout recovery fee. So this is basically a, a fee imposed on coal tonnage that goes to basically paying out the states that have lost money in this last 
you know, two years basically of being wiped out on their, on their uh, reclamation bill. This is really a much more of a east-west play as was described earlier. The people on the east are the ones with all the liabilities. The people on the west are the ones that are all pumping out the coal. So this is really an intra-industry transfer that I'm really suggesting here. Um, and so it is really, from a political standpoint, it is actually much more palatable than, than meets the eye because you do have states like West Virginia, Kentucky, parts of Virginia, Pennsylvania, all these states that have actually have huge liabilities are actually on the side of the people that want to get those paid back. Or, sorry, that want, want to impose a fee. So it's a very unusual situation in the, in the coal industry itself. Longer term, though, we need to think about, again, how do you get that money back? Is there something that could be done on the, on the production side? Uh, a fee that would go on the utility side to help recoup these losses. And you may be saying that's nuts. You know, we can't agree on anything uh, today in the, uh, the current political environment, maybe. But in 2011, I would say you're right. You know, the coal industry was riding, riding high. They, had a, they were doing very well. Met Coal was cruising. They had bought a lot of companies. They had bought a lot of assets. They didn't really need to speak uh, for anybody. Politically, they were very powerful. Today, not so much. And if you can see what the liability uh, mismatch is between the states, you can see there's a very sharp difference in who's owed and who's really still producing that can actually afford to, to actually repay these costs. So I just want to end there. Um, and that's it. Thank you. So, I just want to uh, kick off the Q&A uh, with a question about self-bonding and what exactly the Office of Surface Mining can do within its current statutory authority to start to address some of these problems. And after this first question, I'll open it up to the audience uh, for additional questions. Uh, so during the last panel, it was mentioned that the Office of Surface Mining uh, recently issued this uh, policy advisory recommending that state regulatory authorities uh, exercise greater caution when issuing self-bonds. Uh, and it has also announced that it intends to amend its regulations, strengthen its regulations on self-bonding. And so my question to the three of you is whether you think uh, the policy advisory and the amended regulations uh, could do much to fix the current situation or if it's just too little, too late, uh, and if so, you know, what other approaches might the Office of Surface Mining take? So I guess that's sort of for me. Um, I, I, I don't, the policy advisory I think was worth doing, but I'm not sure how much impact it's actually going to have. I, I believe the, um, one of the pieces of advice that was given was that no more self-bonds or renewed self-bonds should be issued until at least 2021, until the uh, industry settles out. That may be good advice. Again, it's not enforceable, uh, but it, it may at least help provide some guidance. I think in the longer term, there is a serious question about whether we should allow self-bonding at all. I agree with Peter's point that he made on the last panel that, that there's the language in the Service Mining Act, while it authorizes self-bonds, doesn't seem to require them. And we may be at a time when it's just not appropriate anymore to allow self-bonding. If we're going to have it, you know, for one thing, we need to cut out this practice of parking just enough assets in a subsidiary company to allow the, the company to self-bond. I mean, th that's just wrong. OSM should not have allowed that before. They could have easily pierced that, that minimal corporate veil, it seems to me, to avoid that, but they, they chose not to do it. That needs to be fixed. But the other thing that needs to be fixed here, I think, is dealing with the problem of a lack of incentive to actually do the reclamation. And I don't know exactly how you do that, but if I'm right that self-bonding provides no incentive to actually get your bond back because you have nothing at stake, nothing on the line, then that problem needs to be fixed because it's played out in a really bad way, particularly in the Potter River Basin, I would say. I, you know, I think there's a common sense answer to the question or the challenge, and then there's a temporal issue that we have to wrestle with. The common sense, I think, answer is when the regulatory authorities are acting in a creditor capacity, they're expecting a repayment of a future obligation, evaluating the credit worthiness of the obligor is pretty basic. Um, and if you're going to allow someone, that's an entity, to give you an unsecured promise, well, then you better make sure that you dotted the I's and crossed the T on your financial due diligence because that promise is pretty weak on the priority scale. 
The other thing you would want to do is regularly um, uh, get, a, get an update on, on that self-bonding status. If you were granted self-bonding status in year one, in year two, things could be very different. So periodic review, another common sense approach. The part of the challenge is for those companies that go into bankruptcy and they have, um, I'm not going to use the term self-bonds, promises to repay their reclamation <laughs> obligations. And, and then the surety, then the state regulator says, well, yeah, I'm not sure that you're a credit worthy uh, obligor. I'd like you to replace this unsecured promise with something more meaningful like a bank account uh, cash collateralized with 100% of your obligations. You're dealing with a negotiation where the counterparty can't meet the demand. Right? Someone asked the question, is there capacity in the bonding industry to come up with all of the bonds? I think the answer you heard from Brian Resnick was, well, it depends on how much collateral the sureties are requesting. Um, if you're requesting, I mean, first of all, the sureties get paid a premium for providing the basically a form of insurance to the regulators. And so for the right premium, I'm sure you'll have plenty of dry powder on the sidelines to run in and provide uh, surety bonds. Uh, but, but so the temporal, the temporal disconnect is if you wait until your borrower, your obligor is in distress and in bankruptcy and can't possibly meet your demand, uh, you got a problem, which is, what this, which is the question that I was raising while you were up there. You know, Wyoming revoked Arch's privilege of, of providing an unsecured promise and said, look, I want $486 million. And Arch Cole said, that, well, that's great. I, 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 can't, I can't give that to you. And if I, if I, if I, if the, all, my only other alternative is we liquidate, and that's not good for anybody. That's not, not good for the people who live in the state, the people who are employed by the company. Um, and so they made a deal, and I think it was 75, I think. They 75 million super priority yeah. claim, which goes to one of your slides. I'm not sure, and I, I haven't studied this, that they're saying, look, instead of taking 486 million, I'm only going to take 75. I think what they're saying, and I don't have any diligence to back up what I'm about to say, is I'll take 75 today, and it's when you emerge from bankruptcy, we're gonna have to figure out other ways to continue to make periodic payments, sure, to, sure. to to honor your reclamation obligations in the future, maybe yeah. not 20 years out, but it must be said that I mean, my assumption is just they're all dead, <laughs> so they're they're gonna try and it's just not gonna work. You know, like it it's possible in the greatest case scenario that coal rips back and they can all pay off these things, but come on, I mean, but, it's just not it's not a great situation. But to emerge from bankruptcy, and, and, and there's some anecdotal evidence, maybe not even anecdotal, objective evidence, contrary to what I'm about to say. To emerge from bankruptcy, the bankruptcy court has to bang the gavel and say that the plan of reorganization is feasible, not likely to be followed by another need for a restructuring, or someone said before in Chapter 22. So you may be right, um, but I think the parties that are cutting that deal oh, are sure. no, more it's an, optimistic. It's an honest, yeah, it's an honest hope. Yeah. But it's it's just that it's just hope is is all it is. There's no there's no money attached. Just to one more point. <laughs> I think what needs to happen as well is that the company needs to be cited for violating the law because if they don't have a complete bond, if they don't have the, if they don't qualify for self-bonding and they've not posted a, a sufficient surety bond, they are operating in violation of the law. There are many ways to sort of try to resolve that given the distress that the company's in. But citing them gives the federal agency and the state agency leverage to try to make sure that they get a full sure. bond when they can. Uh, and to do other things to make help make the I think it's really move. like the fear of being fired that's going to keep the uh, the asset the, the self bonding to zero. Like no one in the states after this debacle is going to be out there saying we should do this again. Like this is a very <laughs> right. bad outcome for many states. So, yeah. right. thank you. Uh, so, uh, do we have the mics for questions? All right. Um, Start right here. Uh, thank you, Jonathan Chanis, New Tide Asset Management. Uh, obviously, it's different for uh, black lung because that's specific to the coal industry, but can you situate the coal liquidation or reorganization procedures within the spectrum of other extractive industries in the United States? How different is the regime in coal from, say, gold or uranium or copper? 
Well, the good news is, as a bankruptcy lawyer, I've never had to deal with uh, gold, uranium, or copper, with the exception of one of one mine in uh, 1996, a gold mine. So, so I, I don't know if there are um, um, other labor liabilities that affect those industries, but certainly in gold, there's reclamation liabilities and surety bonds. Um, I can't speak specifically to the labor issues. Um, you know, if maybe maybe those industries will come my way one day. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, this is Clark Williams Derry with the Sightline Institute. This is probably a question for Mark. Uh, you, I think you mentioned that, um, well, there, the, there is statutory authorization for self-bonding, although when I look at the, at the law, the legislation, it's very flimsy. There's almost nothing there. There's no, no, no there there. Um, so most of the financial obligations and financial criteria that a company has to meet are set up by the regulation. Right. So I sort of maybe a, a question maybe for all of you is like, well, what should, if, if if Osmer is going to go forward with a with a revised self bonding regulation, what can they do? What could they do that's different than the the existing one that would prevent this sort of thing from happening again in the future? Yeah, so this is probably a better question for my co panelists here. But let me just say one thing about that's a that's a really good question. But but I think one lesson that we can learn from this current experience is that the decline of an industry like coal can happen rapidly so rapidly that the agencies can't keep up. In fact, they do do these annual reviews. I think one of you mentioned that we should be doing annual reviews. They do it. Um, and you know, you could argue that they were asleep at the switch sometimes on these reviews. But, but the point is that um, when you have that risk that, that an industry, uh, an entire industry could fail so rapidly, one has to ask whether the entire program makes any sense. I, I think that the federal and state actors can act like the commercial actors in the private sector. And it doesn't have to be an annual review. It could be, you could put in financial covenants. Um, there are plenty of smart people that can come up with uh, tests to determine. You can ask Andy, he'll come up with a, a, a test on uh, financial covenants that will give you a sense when uh, the company is not in distress, but approaching distress. So. So there are many ways to have early warning signals that you know if your financial profile, um, which is really spectacular today, starts to uh, decline, we need to have you back in the office and have another report and reevaluate. And maybe it doesn't go from self-bonding, excuse me, uh, unsecured promise to 100 percent paper IOU <laughs> open dream. to 100 percent collateral. Maybe it, it's scaled, right? Um, depending on the uh, on the results of the stress test. Uh, we have a couple over here. say, yeah, this plan of reorganization is feasible. What are the courts using as the forecast for coal, right? In the first session, we heard it's really negative, right? As bad as you could imagine. Second session said maybe in the short term it isn't so bad. But, you know, I don't know if they're basing their view on what happens to volumes and pricing and the rest on some of the negative outlook that we heard earlier. It, it, it's very simple. Um, Bankruptcy judges um, are, not, are not experts in the coal industry. They're not experts in retail. They're not experts in the auto sector. Um, it is incumbent upon the parties before the bankruptcy court to present whatever evidence um, they need. Now, if you have a case where everyone is holding hands, it's full consensus, there's no objection to confirmation and to the reorganization, there's not going to be independent scrutiny on the feasibility of three to five year projections and, and the reasonableness of the assumptions underlying those projections. But if you have a group that is challenging those projections or the feasibility analysis, whether it's the creditors committee, a bank group, an equity committee, a retiree committee, then it's the adversary system at work, right? You, have, you put on two competing experts, the judge hears the competing testimony and re renders a decision. So, Can I, I add something just quickly to that? So in the alpha example, I, in my remarks, I said that the US government and the state regulators in alpha were negotiating with a gun to their head. Uh, so government regulators had two really powerful pieces of leverage that could 
could have stopped the Alpha reorganization. They could have prevented all of Alpha's federal leases from transferring to the new companies. And they had scheduled depositions of all of Alpha's financial experts with a list of questions about the basis for their projections of the coal industry going forward. Uh, they never did those depositions because they reached a settlement with Alpha that required some of these funds to be set aside for dedicated money to reclamation of water treatment. But the reason they didn't use the leverage they had was they were afraid that Alpha would just liquidate and dump all of those obligations to the states and the federal government. So they were prepared to do that, but Alpha avoided that adversarial setup, which would have, I think, exposed the flaws in those projections. Right because they didn't want to risk it. But Peabody, for example, now, if you read what their forecasts are and they're coming out of it, they're looking for coal demand to grow in the United States, coal exports to grow pretty healthily for them. So it's a, they're putting on a very, very optimistic view of it, and but, they're getting away with it. Well, let's just pause there for a second. Sure. Um, you see in the oil and gas sector, pr predicting the price of a commodity is challenging. Sure. And to be overly optimistic such that you, you have, you're not anchored in any reality, sure. you're, how are you going to get your investors to, to sign on to, if you have to raise new capital, these are the same projections. No one's going to invest new money in a business because you have to do a rights offering or sure. an equity raise or, or raise debt on projections that the investors, that the private sector thinks are you know, rosy and overly optimistic. So it's hard to say that and I agree that debtors see the future as bright as can be. It's a hockey stick. Here we are today. You know, the, the, every, every, the projections are great. Um, but the checks and balances of the system. So I don't think there's any difference in the coal industry versus oil and gas versus uh, energy field services versus retail. How many, how, what's next season's back to school season going to look like? I mean, sure. I don't know. There's, I mean, there's some regulatory reason why you think coal would not go up. That's my <laughs> point. <laughs> so it's not, but, it's not baked. Uh, but, but, but yes, but oil and gas, you probably say the same thing. No, oil and gas is sky high. It's the world market, I think. Um, Sarah Kendall with the Western Organization of Resource Councils. I wanted to probe a little bit in a slightly different direction to Andy's presentation and what I think you very quickly ran over in terms of your proposal because it sounded to me like a lot of what you were talking about is addressing the liabilities with primarily Appalachian and, and um, Illinois Basin uh, uh, reclamation and, and other liabilities off current production, which is largely in the West. And I'm just curious from a Western perspective, if sure. I understood you correctly, because I think the question we have is, you know, a couple, a decade or so down the line or two or three, um, when Western mines are in the same scenario, sure. like what is there, what's the backstop then? Because, you know, right now we have an AML fee, um, which has been talked about today. And um, you know it addresses reclamation to an extent, but we also have a technological problem, or um, where in the east we have acid mine drainage and other issues that are very challenging, if possible, to reclaim. In the west we have uh, the issue of hydrologic reclamation, sure. and whether um, you know it's going to be possible to restore a water resource to the area that will support agriculture and wildlife. And so I'm kind of curious looking long term, maybe longer term than what you presented, right. whether there's a backstop in your proposal for the West. Well, that, that's why I had the sort of short term fix, which is this, let's just get the, why, let's just get people whole, right, you know, in the very short term for over the next five years or what's been going on in the recent bankruptcies. But longer term, that is about kind of, kind of coming with some kind of utility fee construct where the reality is the liability is much, much larger. And those numbers on the last slide had Wyoming written all over them as well. I mean, they were not uh, isolated to Wyoming, right? I mean, so they were not isolated to the east side. So there is this whole longer term, we have a big problem. Coal industry has basically ran itself on a billion tons a year is the forecast for what keeps the, all those obligations kind of at a standstill. So if we go for, to 500, which is where we are now, this is, this is creating a, a problem that is going to get to go, only get worse over time. So the idea is how do we reserve money for the Wyoming, the Kentucky, all these people that are going to be kind of out of luck, hopefully in 2030 when it's all kind of wound down in some way. So we, that's not a fee on coal production, it's a fee on... Util it's on the utility side, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the first one is on the idea is just on the coal production, and then the second one would be on more broadly on utilities to basically get these states back to whole, because it's a taxpayer obligation at the end of the day. 
I'd just like to clarify one point. I, I think Andy's idea is, is a really good one, but I believe it is the case that the current AML program is specifically set up so you cannot use the money for post-77 mines. I mean, the idea was that that was all taken care of because of the bonding program, and, you know, here we are. But, yeah. but you know, that, that's sort of where it's, so we would either have to amend the AML program sure. to provide some of this money for this, or do something like Andy's well, it's supposed suggesting. To it's supposed to shut down. I mean, it's supposed to be 2021 or something like that. It's the end of the run, supposedly, it, it, it was supposed to be whole. It's, it's time limited. They've yeah, extended yeah. it, but yeah. yes. So I think we have time for one or two more questions, um, maybe in the blue there. Going forward, I'm just wondering if uh, on the uh, reclamation issue, if requiring performance on contemporaneous reclamation could reduce this problem um, and whether that's happening. Yeah, so um, as you know, I believe that it, it could. I think it's important that we do it irrespective of the whole bonding program. Uh, you know, that the, the old time and distance standards that we used to have are difficult to apply in the Western situation, and so that's part of the reason I think they were, they were dumped, and, and I, think, um, I think there probably, though, is some other way to try to assure that reclamation is done contemporaneously and that we get away from just using that language. I'm not sure exactly what that looks like. Um, I think, you know, one of the groups might think about petitioning the agency to adopt some rules to provide standards for contemporaneous reclamation because I'm, I'm guessing that the Powder River Basin is not the only place where that's a, this is a problem, but given what we're seeing with reclamation liabilities, it seems to me that that's another way to come at this problem. If we can reduce liabilities for reclamation costs, then the bonding uh, problem at least is reduced as well. And uh, Ted. Uh, uh, Ted Bowling, CQ. So uh, picking up on, on Andy's thought about um, dealing with this problem, not with the current sphere of, of bankrupt actors, but reaching out broadly to the more historically who's mm -hmm. responsible for this you know, fuel transition, basically, and the stranded costs of a fuel transition, um, to what extent you could use maybe like a CERCLA model to reach back to, you know, the electricity generating sector that benefited from historic yeah, mining practices and, and sure. I mean, some actually ways the taxpayer did, you know, in yeah. some ways, right? So. I mean, that, that might be a So a it's like the utility, the, the people that use the customer, utility customers, yeah, had that advantage, quote unquote. Okay. As long as my light bulb bill doesn't go up as a result of uh, <laughs> you're happy. <laughs> would the tax apply to all forms of electric power generation, or I, I think that's uh, I think it would focus on the coal, frankly, yeah. coal and gas. Obviously, it's it's a carbon related right. issue, but that's how you kind of address carbon in a way that doesn't shut everything down in the West. Right. You know, like that. If the alternative is deal with climate change, do you know, use federal law to close down all of coal in the West, I don't think that's a very viable option, frankly. It's just a lot, it's just gonna be a slower transition. This is a way of kind of making sure that the people that are being disaffected disaffected by this are made whole over a, a longer period of time, sort of 15 to 20 years, because there is, gas is doing very well, and the future of, of gas looks a lot brighter than coal. So you, the end is not nigh-nigh, but you know, 2030, 2040, you have to think about it. Well, thank you all. I think uh, that's a wrap on this panel. <laughs>
the Center on Global Energy Policy for helping keep everything running uh, today. Um, I'd also like to give a special thanks to uh, Jason Bordoff and to Theo Spencer of NRDC for helping out with um, sort of conceptualizing and recruiting uh, panelists for today. It was tremendous help, and uh, both of them were a tremendous help in getting the event together today. Um, quick storyline wrap up. Um, you know, there were a ton of slides, there were a ton of numbers, there were a ton of words that we went through over the course of the day. Um, I think that there is a storyline that we saw, though, running throughout the course of the day. Um, Looking back, both in terms of looking backwards to what brought coal to the moment that we're at now and the projections and forecasts looking forward, we heard about a number of different factors that come to bear. Um, renewables and natural gas sort of being the consensus view on, on what's really driving things. Some competing views on the role of exports and on the, short, and the role of short-term demand and supply and where that leaves uh, the market now and what it means for the future. Uh, all of this has one way or the other left coal in a period of significant transition um, where they're in the process of navigating the process of bankruptcy, um, where the various assets and liabilities are being played out um, and managed and dealt with and reallocated uh, and sometimes abandoned. Uh, and we have in these contexts, of course, as we heard, um, both the employee benefits and the land reclamation issues. Um, when coal does emerge from these bankruptcy, uh, when these coal companies do emerge, they're going to be emerging um, into an uncertain and changing regulatory universe. Um, on the one hand, we have domestic regulations, including the new source performance standards um, and the clean power plan. And we also have the international universe, where we have our commitments under the Paris Agreement, um, all of which is taking place in the very real face of the extraordinary challenge of climate change and the need to address climate change. Um, so this is where the Department of Interior and BLM's project sort of comes to bear. Um, as was mentioned, at one point, the um, Secretary of the Interior has set out a sort of dual mandate to ensure that the federal coal leasing program ensures both a fair return um, and that it adequately accounts for climate change. Uh, there are a number of different approaches that the agency is considering and might consider in the process of um, living up to that mandate. and, and um, Following through on that, um, we heard a little bit about the social cost of carbon and how, whether it be the full social cost of carbon or a partial cost of carbon or some other way of accounting for it. Um, you know, my goal here is not to sort of run through the range of options. That's what the PEIS process is for. Um, but my hope uh, and our hope in convening this event today is that the various presentations that were given and the information that was supplied here and the conversations that we've been able to have have been useful and will help inform that process. Um, so thanks to all of you for, um, for attending, for chiming in or zooming in online, and um, thanks again to everyone. Take care.